so much for joining today's webinar. We are very excited uh, to have you with us today uh, for a discussion about how we can translate uh, Dutch cycling ideas um, into an American context. Um, Going Dutch uh, is the title of this session, and we are um, thrilled that you are with us uh, to join us with this panel today um, for, this, for this presentation. I want to thank a couple of organizations, first off, um, uh, who are behind this webinar and help plan it. The Dutch Cycling Embassy, uh, the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Office of Infrastructure and Water Management, uh, the League of American Bicyclists, um, and the um, uh, Federal Highway Administration. Um, so before I get into some introductions, we have a lot of uh, good material to come uh, to share with you today. I did want to do some housekeeping. Uh, a couple of quick things. Please submit questions when you have them using the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, on the, uh, on the uh, right-hand side of your screen. That's usually where it is. Please submit your questions there when you have them. We are recording the webinar today and we have an archive page set up with a copy of the presentation slides that I will send out shortly. Um, we also have um, uh, posted, or we will be posting the webinar recording there as well. I'll be following up later today with an email about professional development hours and certificates for the webinar um, that you'll get in about an hour after the webinar is concluded. And in a moment, I'll be sharing a link to a page where you can follow along with a live transcript of the webinar um, uh, if you need that. Um, so without further um, delay, where I'd like to start is um, providing an introduction to our first speaker, uh, some, some remarks provided by um, Ambassador Andre Haspels, um, the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the United States based in Washington, D.C. Um, Haspels grew up in Uithoorn uh, in the province of Nordholland. Um, his father was a flower trader who imported flowers from all over the world, including ferns from Florida. And since he was a young boy, Haspels has always seen flowers, and that's why he learned about agriculture and trade. Uh, studied politics at the Virge Universiteit of Amsterdam, and I apologize for my poor pronunciation. Uh, in 1987, he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he served in many capacities, and in 1997 became head of political department in the embassy of South Africa, uh, where we, he was involved in cooperation between two nations, among others, in the setup of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, we are thrilled to have some remarks um, uh, from the ambassador right now, and um, I will uh, turn it over to his um, video for, for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to speak at this webinar on Dutch cycling ideas. Due to the COVID pandemic, the interest in biking has increased tremendously all over the world. And when looking for inspiration when implementing cycling policies, where else should you look than towards the Dutch? We Dutch and our bicycles are inseparable. The Netherlands has about 17 million residents, but nearly 25 million bicycles. Dutch children learn to ride a bicycle before kindergarten. They ride their bike to school, to visit friends, or just for fun. And it becomes an essential part of their childhood. What we learn and enjoy as children often becomes important to us as adults. Bikes are a great example. We bike to work, to go shopping, and often as a last mile solution for transit. And the My apologies, folks. Uh, let me try that one more time. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to speak at this webinar on Dutch cycling ideas. Due to the COVID pandemic, the interest in biking has increased tremendously all over the world. And when looking for inspiration when implementing cycling policies, where else should you look than towards the Dutch? We Dutch and our bicycles are inseparable. The Netherlands has about 17 million residents, but nearly 25 million bicycles. Dutch children learn to ride a bicycle before kindergarten. They ride their bike to school, to visit friends, or just for fun. And it becomes an essential part of their childhood. What we learn and enjoy as children often becomes important to us as adults. Bikes are a great example. We bike to work, to go shopping, and often as a last mile solution for transit. And the figures show it. A large number of Dutch children bike to school. 45% of train passengers arrive at the station by bike. 
of all trips nationwide, 26% is made by bike. And in some cities, this even reaches 50%. But this hasn't always been the case. Cars became commonplace in the 1960s, so they took over the streets. Biking became hazardous. The number of traffic casualties in the Netherlands peaked in 1970, but has dropped 85% since. We gradually created safer cycling infrastructure, and in some cases, even reserving whole streets to pedestrians and cyclists. And that is exactly what we see happening now in cities around the world and in the United States. With more people looking for other forms of safe transportation like cycling, cities need to adapt quickly to ensure that the roads are safe for cyclists. And in this webinar, you will hear from Dutch and US experts regarding ways cities could approach this task. Don't forget, the Netherlands didn't become the cycling nation overnight. We worked hard to get where we are, and we are happy to share our lessons learned and expertise with others so they can get there as well. I hope you enjoy the webinar and are inspired by it. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, and thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your comments and your um, your inspirational um, uh, nations uh, lessons for us, and we're going to find uh, more of that as we as we move through the presentation. Um, uh, moving along in the presentation now of his continuing opening remarks, um, we have uh, are pleased to welcome Jeanette Sadiq Khan. Uh, Jeanette is one of the world's uh, foremost authorities on transportation and urban transformation. Uh, she served as New York City's transportation commissioner from 2007 to 2013 under Mayor Michael Bloomberg, overseeing historic changes to the city streets pedestrianizing Broadway and Times Square, building nearly 400 miles of bike lanes, seven rapid bus lines, and creating more than 60 plazas citywide. A founding principal with the Bloomberg Associates, uh, she works with mayors around the world uh, to reimagine and redesign their cities. Uh, she chairs the National Association of Transportation Officials, uh, City Transportation Officials Global Designing Cities Initiative, implementing new people-focused street design standards, which have been adopted in more than 150 cities across the United States, and around the world. Uh, We're pleased to have Jeanette with us now. Um, I will uh, turn my video off and, um, and Jeanette, I've sent you a webcam request. Got it. Great, you're up and running, thank you. Great, well, hello everyone. Uh, it's great to be here and those were great remarks from the ambassador. Um, as was mentioned, I was the transportation commissioner under Meyer, Mayor Mike Bloomberg for six and a half years and under his watch, we built almost 644 kilometers of bike lanes, the largest expansion of cycling infrastructure in any US city. And we also built the first protected, parking protected bike lane in North America in 2007. Now, I don't know if it would get the Dutch cycling embassy seal of approval, but I was definitely inspired by the bike lane designs that are common on the streets of the Netherlands. And it was revolutionary stuff in New York City at the time. And the number one reaction that we got when we put protected bike lanes across New York City in neighborhood after neighborhood was, you can't do this, we're not Amsterdam. They sometimes said, you can't do this, we're not Copenhagen. And sometimes they said both. It's hard to understand what the objection was really about. Who wouldn't want to live in a city where you could get from place to place safely and quickly and affordably, where it's safe for kids and seniors to ride a bike. We were criticized by politicians and the press, and we were sued and spent years in court defending bike lanes. But I'm happy to say that people were way ahead of the press and the politicians, despite all the backlash. And New Yorkers ended up supporting bike lanes overwhelmingly, according to the last opinion polls taken at the end of the Bloomberg administration. And there's now a commitment from Bloomberg's successor to bring 30 miles of protected bike lanes to city streets every year. And these designs took off across the nation since that first protected bike lane went in. 
We went from no protected bike lanes on city streets in the United States in 2007 to more than 500 in 124 cities in 44 states by 2017. From DC to Chicago to Seattle, and even in driving cities like Los Angeles, cycling has been flourishing in every city as new cycling infrastructure is built. And those same paths that protect cyclists also make city streets safer, more accessible, and more livable for everyone. And now when other cities try to put bike lanes, people still protest the implementation of bike lanes, but they say, you can't do that here. We're not New York. <laughs> so that's another Dutch legacy in the United States via New York. Biking infrastructure is now critical mobility dropped during this pandemic. And cities that have that infrastructure have a strategic advantage. As cities reopen, people are looking for choices, alternatives to public transport and options for, sh for shorter trips. But unfortunately, there seems to be a rush to restore the, set the status quo in American cities, which have been largely built around the automobile with devastating results. Last year, there were more than 37,000 traffic deaths in the United States, and vehicle emissions are the single largest contributor to air pollution. And we just simply cannot go back to this broken status quo. But we're not gonna be able to break car culture in American cities by guilt tripping everyone. We have to give people safer, more sustainable transportation options and make these options more accessible, affordable, and convenient. It's been good to see that bike shops were allowed to reopen early in the pandemic and, and characterized as essential service. And biking inventory has been wiped out in thousands of stores across the country. Many cities have implemented temporary bike lanes as a way to attract and protect larger numbers of riders. But the United States is not fully capitalizing on this moment the way other cities are. I've been working with Mayor Sala in Milan on his COVID transportation recovery plan, which expands bike and pedestrian spaces along 42 kilometers of streets. And Mayor Hidalgo has plans for 650 kilometers of bike lanes in Paris. And Mayor Sadekan is implementing temporary and car-free streets in London. It's remarkable to me that the Netherlands doesn't even register on the European Cyclist Federation tracker of new bike lanes and public spaces created in response to the pandemic. That's because it's already built the kind of streets that cities around the world are racing to implement right now. If more American cities are built with cycling infrastructure, it wouldn't just help with recovery, it would improve public health, reduce emissions, and increase economic opportunity by connecting people with affordable transportation. It would also give us cities that work better for more people than the one that existed before the pandemic. In other words, where the Netherlands has been all along. The road reclamations happening around the world aren't just emergency actions, they're strategies for long-term economic recovery and will define the way cities look, feel, and function for decades to come. Many thanks for inviting me today and for your continuing inspiration. I look forward to hearing and learning from all of you. that and um, you're, those are inspiring words from from someone who's really has been a leader in this in this area um, I'm going to um, take the control back and move into our next panelist um, and, and as I'm doing that um, I, I wanted to let you all know that um, we are working on we've noticed that there were some technical issues some of you didn't have audio and so um, hopefully um, you have got that running uh, now and we are all uh, squared away so I apologize if there were any problems there um, but we are um, moving into our next panelist, which is Bill Nesper. And Jeanette, if you want to, let's see, I'll take you off there. Wonderful. Thank you. And I'll um, get this screen set up. Yes. All right. Sorry about that delay, everyone. Um, 
Bill Nesper uh, is our next panelist. I want to tell you a little bit about Bill. He is the executive director of the League of American Bicyclists, the national organization uh, promoting bicycling and protecting the rights of people who bicycle uh, since 1880. Uh, Bill first joined the League in 2002, and before becoming ED, spent most of his time at the League directing the Bicycle Friendly America program that recognizes rates and provides a roadmap for communities, businesses, universities, and states to make bicycling safe, comfortable, and accessible to all. Um, Bill, uh, we've got you up and running, um, and please go ahead whenever you're ready. Awesome, thanks a lot, and uh, thanks to Jeanette uh, for her inspiring words and, and leadership uh, through this. Uh, and so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining today and for your tireless work to make bicycling and walking better in your communities. Uh, since 1880, the League of American Bicyclists has been the national nonprofit organization representing bicyclists and promoting bicycling for transportation, better health, quality of life. Today, the League is an organization of 200,000 members and supporters and 1,000 state and local groups, all empowering people to transform their lives through, and communities through bicycling. A core function of the League is also to amplify the Voices for Better Bicycling uh, funding and policies from Capitol Hill to your community to make sure that your projects and programming are properly supported. It's my pleasure to speak with you today for this incredibly important session. We at the League are grateful for the Embassy of the Netherlands, to the Dutch Cycling Embassy, the Federal Highway Administration, and of course the City of Austin and Washington DC for making this webinar possible. My hope is that uh, after today's presentations that we all feel even more inspired to act. Back in March, if I can take you back, as we were all adjusting to the reality of life in the global pandemic, many of us searched for silver linings among the bad news. Uh, at first, we eagerly took photos of bike-filled streets and trails. We saw more people than ever, from families to first responders, choosing to bike. This was deeply encouraging for advocates who, who in turn, leapt into action to make sure that bike shops were considered essential businesses, to speak out for more space for biking and walking, and to create online resources to help people ride safely and confidently. Cities from Minneapolis to Miami, from Oakland to Philadelphia saw increases in ridership and bicycling sales reached levels that caused shortages in many places across the country. People embraced bicycling as one of the few ways that they could get exercise, relieve stress of their days, and safely get to where they needed to go. But with all this enthusiasm, it became really clear quickly that uh, cities lacked infrastructure to meet the increased demand, making physical distancing recommendations nearly impossible to maintain. As more people got on their previously neglected bikes or picked up new ones, the lack of cohesive networks of bike lanes, slow streets, and connected trails became glaringly obvious to many riders, especially as car traffic has begun to pick up. The pandemic also quickly revealed the health disparities and racial inequities that exist in our communities. Nearly six months in and with no clear return to normal in sight, we face a critical need to provide safe and sustainable and comfortable opportunities for all people to ride in every neighborhood. When bicycling isn't safe and in a real driving and riding public transportation, it further exacerbates the many systemic inequalities in health and well being of those who stand to benefit most from accessibility to biking and other active transportation. So it's important for us to also to take, a, take an account from history. So we've seen many bike booms before. Um, in fact, the League uh, was a product of that first bike boom in the 1800s and has seen several rebirths thanks to subsequent peaks in biking's popularity. The biggest boom of the 20th century occurred in the 1970s. And why it wasn't sustained was, is, is central to Carlton Reed's excellent book, Bike Boom, in his recent article in Forbes. In part, he argues, it was because the environmental movement prioritized other things, they moved on, and didn't continue to see bicycling as central to their advocacy goals. This is still a challenge now, as much of the focus for change still privileges technological innovations over common sense, dare I say, boring investments in creating slow, safe networks in 15 minute neighborhoods. I think, right is, I think Reed was right about uh, one of the main reasons for the decline of the last boom when he said that, quote, those attracted to it were not sufficiently sold on the idea to carry on riding long-term, either recreationally or critically for Dutch style daily transport, end quote. I think this really gets to the heart of one of our movement's biggest challenges, which is seeing is believing. If the public believes that bicycle-friendly communities are possible where they live, first by seeing what is happening in American cities like you will today, and better yet, experiencing it in their own cities, we'll have more allies. Many of you have helped make these eureka moments happen in your communities, from demonstration projects to complete streets and moving towards complete networks. We need more of those na nationwide right now as people are on bikes and will be asking, why can't I ride my bike there? To boost us, to build back better and not lose momentum. 
thanks to groups like NACTO and, and FHWA, the last 15 years have given us guidance and permission to build. Now, for the average person, we need to show them a future where they can see themselves riding in, especially for short everyday, everyday trips. And while it's sad that we aren't together on a, on a study trip to the Netherlands right now, I really hope that that was going to happen, um, uh, we have an opportunity to strengthen our playbook for implementation and making the case to the public as we look at the Dutch model and those shared principles being applied in U.S. gold-level bicycle-friendly communities. The Dutch made different decisions for prioritizing people movement back in the 1970s when both of our countries faced the gas crisis. They built something together and now their children and grandchildren are reaping the benefits of this legacy. We at the League are striving to help create a similar, a similar legacy here for future generations. From advocating for better funding that supports your projects to providing tools for transformation and inspiration to local change makers supporting that work. Please visit us at bikeleague.org um, if, if you haven't already. And I just want to say thank you to all of you for, for making good transportation choices easier to make. Your work leading us towards a healthier and more sustainable future gives us all hope that we can emerge from this time stronger. Thanks very much. Bill, thank you for those words and uh, for being here on this panel today. Um, our next uh, panelist uh, I want to uh, introduce is uh, Chris Bruntlett, uh, who is Marketing and Communications Manager at the Dutch Cycling Embassy. Uh, public-private partnership that represents the best knowledge, experience, and experts from the Netherlands. Uh, as a longtime campaigner in Vancouver, he fell in love with Dutch bike culture in 2016, inspiring him to co-author the book, uh, Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality. Chris uses his knowledge and passion to share practical lessons for global cities wishing to follow their footsteps and become better places to live, work, and of course, uh, cycle. Um, Chris, I'm going to be handing the screen to you uh, right now, and I'll let you know when you are up and running. Okay. Great. Looks good, Thanks, Chris. Dan. Thank you. Wonderful. Let's get cracking. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings from across the Atlantic. Uh, as Dan so eloquently introduced, my name is Chris Brunlett, and I am Marketing and Communication Manager for the Dutch Cycling Embassy. I'm based in Delft, but our office is located in Utrecht in the center of the Netherlands. Quick uh, introduction to our organization. We're a public-private uh, organization uh, that uh, is a collaboration between the national government here in the Netherlands and about 70 partner organizations. Uh, they all work in the field of uh, cycling and they're looking to export the knowledge and expertise they've built up over the years internationally. So they're private consultants, technology suppliers, uh, academic institutions, municipal governments, you name it, uh, all kinds of uh, different groups that have been working on cycling for a very, very long time. Our work is two-pronged. Um, we do a lot of hosting of study tours and workshops here in the Netherlands, so we welcome groups of politicians, planners, policymakers. We show them the, the streets of the Netherlands and, and take them for guided tours uh, and then put them in a classroom setting and, and put what they've seen into context. Uh, and inversely, we do go to these places and, and bring teams of Dutch experts to departments of transport, to municipal governments, uh, and work on specific challenges and, and problems that uh, that city is experiencing uh, through the, the Dutch lens. Obviously, both of those uh, are very difficult these, these days, and so we're switching a lot of our work to more digital advocacy, um, hosting the, uh, webinars and the like, uh, with the hopes of resuming a lot of these activities in 2021. So if you've been paying attention on, on social media these days, as, as all of my predecessors have mentioned, there's a bit of a cycling boom happening in, in cities around the world. These are images from Berlin, Milan, uh, Oakland, and Sydney, Australia. And it's really being fueled out of necessity rather than opportunity. Uh, initially during lockdown, it was to provide people with a, uh, a responsible means to physically distant uh, and get some exercise, some fresh air, and, and uh, keep uh, maintain their physical and mental health. Uh, but as cities came out of lockdown, it was to provide an alternative to public transport, knowing that the capacity and the attractiveness of those public transport systems were going to be reduced for the foreseeable future. And if every single one of those persons uh, who didn't take the bus or the tram or the train to uh, wherever they were going, hopped in a car, uh, suddenly the cities uh, would be in, in big trouble in terms of the additional traffic that they would be experiencing on their streets. And so as a result, cities are building very quick, cheap uh, networks of bicycle infrastructure, 
the European Cyclist Federation has been keeping track and at last count there's been over 2,000 kilometers built uh, just in the European continent and over a billion euros uh, committed to cycling. Uh, just today there was a two billion pound uh, five-year plan announced by the British government. Um, so virtually every city's uh, starting to implement more cycling on their streets. Again, not out of opportunity, but purely out of necessity. But as, as Jeanette mentioned, uh, there's one country that's perhaps not on the list and, and you're hearing precious little from the Netherlands uh, when it comes to these kinds of pop-up temporary measures. Uh, but that is for good reason. And, and as Jeanette mentioned, they, it's because these networks already exist. Almost 37,000 kilometers of fully separated bike lanes uh, that stretch across the country. That's almost a quarter of the road network here in the Netherlands. Um, and 80% of the urban streets in, in the country are local access streets. Um, so they are severely traffic calmed uh, to a speed of 30 kilometers an hour or slower. That's about 20 miles per hour. Um, so there's plenty of space for walking and cycling, entire networks that already exist to help people get from A to B, um, no matter what mode of transport they choose. Um, and it has really absorbed the, the lost capacity when it comes to the public transport system here uh, in the Netherlands. So uh, all this work that was done all those years ago has, has come into an, uh, an advantage and, and made this country much more resilient in terms of its transportation network. But as, as has been mentioned previously, this didn't happen uh, by accident. The, the Netherlands didn't rise up out of the North Sea with all this infrastructure pre-built. It was in response to a very similar and a very um, sudden crisis that occurred here in 1973. For six weeks, uh, the Netherlands was subject to an oil embargo by the oil producing nations, uh, and uh, the cars uh, virtually stopped moving. Uh, there was a, uh, a spike in gasoline prices, a, a doubling of bicycle sales, and the streets suddenly went quiet and, and were opened up to people walking and cycling. And, uh, and not only changed a, a, um, an ap the appetite from the general public, but the politicians suddenly realized that they had to um, stop building their cities around the private automobile and start reallocating that public space in a more equitable and a, uh, a more fair manner. And, and safety was always at the forefront of that. At the time, there were 3,000 uh, people dying a year in traffic, almost 400 of whom were children. Um, and that became a catalyst to take their country in a very different direction than uh, where a lot of other cities and countries were headed. So I'm going to uh, impart on you a few lessons from those 50 years of, of trial and error uh, in the hopes that uh, other countries can avoid the error part of that equation and, and focus on the solutions that work because the Dutch really have figured out uh, best practice for a lot of things. And I'm, I'm going to just touch on a few of those in my presentation today. Uh, the first thing I, I want to stretch, uh, stress sorry, is, is not to be afraid to experiment. And I think the, the years coming out of that oil crisis, um, the Dutch tried a lot of different things. They, they were willing to overhaul their streets and then overhaul them again if that didn't work. And in some cases, uh, in a lot of cases, um, they were deemed failures and, and sent back to the drawing board. Uh, the two most prominent examples were in Tilburg in the top left corner and uh, in Den Haag in the top right corner. They were uh, demonstration routes that were started by the national government in, in the mid-1970s uh, in an attempt to show what modern cycling infrastructure could look and feel like. And uh, they were both rather spectacular failures, uh, in part because they were just individual routes that re didn't really connect to a larger network. So in Tilburg's case, um, it was kind of uh, set aside and, and forgotten about. And in, in The Hague, it actually drug up a lot of controversy uh, and some of the local shopkeepers actually paid construction workers to come in the middle of the night and dig up the, the cycle track and they were ultimately fined. But um, if, you, if you feel like uh, the Netherlands was, uh, happened without controversy or, or without a fight, I think this story more than anything proves that sometimes they get it wrong and, and they have to work very hard to, to correct those errors. But out of that process, um, they came uh, more, more of a network approach. And that started in Delft uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, when the planners suddenly realized that rather than designing and building individual routes, they had to take a more uh, citywide approach and design an entire grid. Uh, and in Delft's case, it wasn't just one grid, but three different grids um, that uh, provided for a variety of trip speeds, trip distances, and trip types. Uh, that allowed for the trip to school, the trip to the community center, the trip to a friend's house, uh, and lastly, and, and probably leastly, the, the trip to work itself. 
So it connected by connecting a, a variety of origins and destinations. It took a more holistic approach, um, and it ultimately was uh, used to implement these design principles now that uh, we we tout around the world and we take around the world from the Crow Design Manual for Bicycle Traffic, um, which has five pr principles for designing successful bicycle infrastructure. I'm going to run through those quite quickly, but uh, if you require further reading or would like to learn more, please do get in touch or get yourself a copy of the Crow Manual. The first requirement is cohesion, and um, this is uh, probably as, as simple as it gets. Uh, as I was saying, it's it's correct, uh, connecting as many origins and destinations as possible and understanding that a network is only as strong as its weakest link. So if you have a particularly stressful or hairy intersection, um, then people may end up choosing another alternative form of transportation. Uh, the pr second principle is directness. And again, this uh, sounds rather obvious, but unfortunately bicycling usually gets the short end of the stick. Uh, people on bikes do not want to take the long way around. They don't want to take multiple detours and, and several hundred meters out of their way. They will choose ultimately the path of least resistance. So uh, these networks should be designed to give people the most direct uh, way from, from A to B as possible. Uh, safety, again, is another uh, kind of uh, obvious one, perhaps, but um, it uh, it's just simply states that people don't want to risk their lives uh, in getting from A to B, and we should not be forcing them to do so. We don't do it with uh, any other mode of transport, be it trains, boats, or, or railways, uh, but somehow there is this element of risk in cycling that's assumed, uh, and the planners must do as much as they can to remove that that's a danger element from the process of, of cycling from A to B. Uh, comfort is a, a little bit more of a, perhaps a luxury uh, in terms of additional stress that's added to the user, whether it's noise, whether it's um, additional stops at traffic lights, long waits at traffic lights, uh, but the network should be designed to minimize uh, the number of disruptions and stresses to, to the user and really looked at from a user perspective. Uh, and then finally, attractiveness may be the nicest or the, uh, the the least critical element, but um, cyclists like like anyone uh, would like a, a an attractive route in that uh, the views, the the connection to nature, the proximity to water are all taken into consideration when selecting a route. Uh, the other thing uh, I'd like to stress is that every bicycle plan needs a car plan, and and this came out of uh, various experiments that happened in Groningen is perhaps the first and most prominent. But this idea that we need to control motor vehicle traffic, we cannot let it flee, flow th freely through the city, um, that uh, in a lot of instances there are car management pan plans that create a hierarchy of roads um, and push the car traffic to the perimeter of the city uh, and through modal filters and, and filtered permeability uh, allow for walking and cycling as the, the most direct and, and quickest way from A to B. The electric bike has become uh, incredibly popular here, not so much as a way faster way to get from A to B, but um, as a range extender. So allowing people in, into older age, traveling further distances, um, and they proved incredibly popular amongst the elderly population here. Um, and in other places around the world, they certainly have a, a uh, potential for flattening hills and, and uh, reducing sweat from the equation. Um, so they sh certainly should be used if we're talking about replacing um, uh, public transport trips for uh, other means of, of transportation. But public transport isn't going to be uh, at that reduced capacity forever. And uh, quite frankly, when it comes back online, it's going to need all the help it can get. And one thing that I think the Netherlands does really well is uh, use cycling uh, not as a uh, competition to the public transport system, but as an ally uh, that can feed more customers into the public transport system, the bus networks, the tram networks, and the train networks, um, give, by providing them with the direct infrastructure and the secure place to park their bike, uh, and then also with a last mile solution on the other side of their trip, um, because more often than not, they're discouraged from taking their bikes on the public transport, but uh, leaving it at the, the stop or the station. So I'll end my uh, presentation today with a, a plea, and that's um, that we should be designing our networks, our infrastructure um, with uh, everyone in mind. And, and far too often, I think we assume that if it works for um, a fit white man, um, then it works for everybody. And that simply isn't, isn't the case. 
And uh, one thing that the Dutch have shown is that if you design for everybody, everybody will use it. And that includes children, that includes teenagers, that includes the elderly, uh, that includes uh, groups that are perhaps physically disabled or of low or second social economic status. Um, there is no uh, cultural hang up to cycling. The, the barriers that exist really are uh, on our streets and we should be doing all that we can to remove those. So thank you for your attention today. Um, I'll just uh, wrap up by encouraging you to visit our website if you want to learn more information. It's dutchcycling.nl. Uh, and we are all over the social media these days. If you'd like to connect with us, uh, we look forward to uh, answering your questions in the Q&A and uh, hearing from you in the, in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, really wonderful inspiration there, um, right from the, uh, the Dutch experience. So, um, I'll take the screen now uh, to introduce our next panelist, um, Darren Buck. Uh, Darren is the Pedestrian and Bicycle Program Coordinator in the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Human Environment, and he oversees a variety of projects related to research uh, that promote safe, comfortable, and complete networks uh, for bicycle and pedestrian travel. Uh, pr prior to this role, Darren managed the Complete Streets Program at the City of Alexandria, Virginia, and was bicycle and bike share planner at the District of Columbia's uh, Department of Transportation. Um, so Darren, we're, we're thrilled to have you. Um, I'll be sending you the screen right now, and I'll let you know uh, when you're up and running. Hey, great. Uh, can you hear me and see my screen? I can. All right, excellent. Uh, let me just put this to full screen. There we go. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I, I won't go into a, a, a giant uh, introduction, but we'll say that um, this sort of marks a turn in, in the, uh, the webinar program. We're going to um, shift from sort of the Dutch experience to how we are starting to apply that uh, in a United States context. Um, I'm going to go over a lot of Federal Highway's recent work uh, in bicycle planning and design, uh, which has aimed us to get to to get us to a point where we're accommodating people's level of comfort with interacting with motor vehicles while on a bicycle. Uh, last year, we created and released this info, Im, infographic image on the right uh, through Federal Highway social media that um, sort of tried to shift a focus onto user comfort. And a lot of that uh, shift um, is thanks in part to our partnership uh, with the Royal Dutch Embassy over the years. Um, that opportunity to participate in global knowledge exchange and bring best practices into U.S. practice, uh, I think is summarized pretty well in a summary report. Uh, you see the image on the left um, on what we learned from the Dutch uh, through Federal Highways Global Benchmarking Program. You can access that report through the link at the bottom of the page. Um, we continue to work with the Global Benchmarking Program on our variety um, of potential bike and pedestrian projects. Uh, we will be doing a project with them focused on pedestrian safety uh, in the coming calendar year. Anyway, um, with that emphasis on designing for the user in mind, uh, the unanswered question many planners and engineers have had in the United States is, if I wanted to provide a network where people of all ages and bicycling abil abilities feel safe, what sort of facility is appropriate to the context? Uh, so this is one of the primary questions that Federal Highway's new bicycle facility design course uh, seeks to help with. Um, so we just released a comprehensive uh, revamp of our National Highway Institute bicycle facility design training. Uh, besides bringing the content up to date and consistent with all the design guidance that has come out in the past few years, one of the biggest changes is a conversion to web-based. Um, it's available now for free to anybody. It has about 10 modules. They take uh, approximately eight hours in total, but you can take them at your own pace and you can take as many or as few as you'd like. It's AICP approved for continuing maintenance credit and you can access it via the link at the bottom of the screen again. Again, I wanna stress it's free. Uh, I highlighted uh, this summary slide from that course because it, it summarizes well a bicycle planning approach that has some parallels to that Crow Manual content that Chris described earlier. Like the Crow Manual, we place emphasis on not only creating safe places for people to travel by bike, but consider people's perceptions of comfort. Connectivity uh, covers both that directness and cohesion concept that the Crow Manual describes. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point uh, where we're planning for attractiveness net yet, but it's certainly that's something that I think individual project uh, engineers strive for. Uh, We've had several good conversations over the years uh, with the American Society of Landscape Architects, or ASLA. They have a 
big and growing interest in bicycle facility design and are probably a good place to start thinking about uh, the aesthetic aspects. Um, so I'm gonna describe a few other things that Federal Highway has done in the past few years to promote, promote these planning and design principles uh, of creating safe, comfortable, and connected uh, places to travel by bike. Sorry, a little hang up on my end. Uh, we've tried to advance uh, the practice of bike design and planning over the past few years, and just a few of the resources are shown here. Uh, the link at the bottom will take you to those and more, and we'll cover a few of these next. One thing I want to highlight, though, is that while we're largely focused today on examining a city context, um, we strive to improve safety, comfort, and connectivity in all contexts. So while I'll be highlighting some things today that are particularly uh, urban focused, I would urge you those of you who are joining from a small town, a suburban or a rural setting or a statewide uh, DOT to go ahead, check out uh, resources such as our small town and, and rural uh, multimodal networks guidebook. Um, look at all of these resources and see where they deal with different contexts. Uh, we do strive for some universality in what we do. Um, one of the big resources that we did in the past few years um, was our separated bike lane and design guide. This was released uh, in 2015 and was our first real foray into this uh, uh, new for us design solution. At the outset of our design chapter, we present a four step design process that's sort of centered around deciding which way and how wide a facility can be. Um, thinking about the forms of separation that are appropriate for it, identifying where on the mid block there may be design challenges and solutions around things like curbside access and then finally taking a look at that intersection and uh, even back then in 2015 we were um, we were starting to delve into uh, new intersection uh, geometries such as the bend out design um, however before uh, before we issued that separated bike lane design guide we did something that we um, aim to sort of advance the state of the practice um, uh, through allowing and through promoting other sources of design guidance. So there, back in 2013, there was a design flexibility memo. You can find a link at the bottom. It was an important predecessor step in that it highlighted the availability of other newer design resources, things like the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide, already available for use for, by practitioners. Uh, this was a first step in getting separated bike lane design into mainstream practice. Another important step um, will be the new, the new edition of AASHTO's bike uh, guide to the development of bicycle facilities. It's been in development for a long time, still has a while to go, but right now it includes some very large steps forward in bicycle planning and design. Um, Another more recent resource put out by Federal Highway is the Bikeway Selection Guide. It helps practitioners decide what type of bikeway is appropriate to the contact. Uh, it links planning and the selection. Um, I'm sorry, I've got a bunch of pop-ups happening on my screen here. Um, helps, uh, uh, helps practitioners decide what type of bikeway is appropriate to context. Planning and selection of that bikeway emphasizes the use of engineering judgment design flexibility documentation and experimentation to arrive at solutions that maximize safety, comfort, and connectedness. A chart shown here is one of the major outputs of that guide, it shows the type of facility that practitioners should consider given the context of a roadway if their goal is to provide that all ages and abilities type comfort. Um, bikeway selection, it's a multi-step process, begins with policy, culminates in design. Um, over the past few years, uh, we've devoted quite a bit of work uh, to providing resources to advance the state of practice in multimodal network planning. We intend to continue that work to help advance planning and analysis for non-motorized modes to a state comparable to that of the road network. The landscape has shifted in recent years or months. Uh, micromobility has entered the streetscape and none of the resources work that we've done have really anticipated this. So while it's still valid work that we're gonna continue to build upon, we now have all new modes of transportation to consider. Uh, one example in our network work is the bike network mapping idea book. Another, again, link available at the bottom describes some examples of how jurisdictions have tackled the complex task of mapping and describing their bicycle travel networks. 
Um, we also have our guidebook to measuring multimodal network connectivity. Uh, there's a link uh, on the prior page. Um, it's our primary resource to guide agencies in planning a network that provides safe, comfortable, connected, and direct routes for bicyclists. After completed that, completing that guide, we then funded eight communities with grants uh, to put the process described in the guidebook into practice. Uh, the projects themselves are making use of a variety of measurement tools to answer a bunch of planning questions in a variety of contexts. Some are even making use of novel new data sources like street light and sidewalk labs data. Um, these projects are scheduled to wrap up later this calendar year. Um, and we'll be getting project managers together to share their work, talk about lessons learned, and help us decide um, what our work in future years needs to be around promoting uh, better uh, multimodal network planning practices. Um, these are the communities that we selected. They represent not only a variety of geo geographies and contexts, but also a mix of state DOTs, MPOs, transit agency. Um, we've received several of the final work products from these grants. We expect to post the, the, those reports as well as a summary of the peer exchange activities that we're doing in the coming months. Uh, finally, uh, I'll get to Thinkbike, which since 2010, uh, the Dutch Cycling Embassy, the Royal Dutch Embassy, uh, has been offering to North American cities to help them plan and design bicycle facilities and networks. Uh, between 2010 and 2017, Federal Highway and the Embassy collaborated on these workshops in a variety of U.S. cities, including Detroit, Seattle, Milwaukee, Chattanooga, um, and uh, Washington, D.C., which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, typically, it's a two-day event. Uh, the workshops brought together a variety of local practitioners from public and private sector, advocates, community members, and uh, experts brought in from the Netherlands who have tackled these questions in their own country um, to help inform local decisions. Um, I was fortunate to be able to participate in a Think Bike uh, workshop in DC in 2010 as a grad student uh, where we tackled design questions on two different corridors in the district uh, that were identified as being important to future bicycle connectivity. Um, I then participated in a subsequent 2016 workshop as an employee of the DC Department of Transportation, and I worked with Federal Highway and the Embassy to organize a planning focused uh, workshop uh, that my friend Will Hansfield is gonna describe uh, a little bit later. Um, I just wanted to wrap up quickly with a quick thanks to our, our partners at the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, PBIC, uh, who did a great job supporting this webinar and all of their fantastic work, uh, their webpage. Uh, pedbikeinfo.org was recently reorganized to provide a more topic-based way to access all of the latest uh, information and research, both from Federal Highway and many, many, many others on many uh, ped and bike subjects. Uh, check out their site uh, next time you have a question or just want to learn a little bit more about a new topic. Um, and that's about it. There's my contact info, and I will uh, turn it back to Dan. Hey, thank you so much, um, Darren, to hear about all those exciting things happening at FHWA. Um, we'll continue on with our panel discussion right now uh, with our next panelist, uh, Nathan Wilkes. Uh, Nathan is a, a senior multimodal street designer and network planner uh, working for the city of Austin. Uh, he's responsible for the multimodal planning, design, review, and implementation of region-wide projects. Uh, over the past dozen years with the city, he has helped Austin become a national leader in innovative planning, street design, and bicycle network build out with a focus on um, all ages and abilities. Um, Nathan, we're excited uh, to have you here uh, with us today, and I'm gonna send you the screen right now. Um, I'll let you know when you're up and running. Well, it's great, can you hear go right me? ahead. You yes. hear me see me? Okay. Well, thanks for having me. This is a topic close to my heart and never spoke to it before, so I'll jump right in. Um, yeah, I feel like Austin has quite a story and uh, kind of a rich one. So in, in 2009, uh, you know, this is, I'm going to chronologically start where we were. And, you know, uh, that's the cover of our bike plan. Lance Armstrong was a local hero and still in favor. Uh, these people were really excited about this brand new painted five foot bike lane on a 40,000 per day, you know, high speed arterial in the center of the city. So that as a jumping off spot, um, uh, in the 2010, 2011 was kind of the awakening period. Um, 
if you can't go on a study tour this year because of the pandemic, get online. <laughs> So I started reading the four types of cyclists uh, was kind of the first thing that started urging me in the direction of, wow, the interest and concern is this huge uh, demographic that we're not serving with our painted infrastructure. Um, Roger Geller was kind of an oracle in that way for the US to kind of put it, put it so well and it's been validated by research following. And then you started um, in the US, if you're a practitioner putting in painted bike lanes, you started seeing New York City just disrupting everything, putting in protected bike lanes, the NACTO guidance, uh, you know, NACTO came into being, um, you know, and, and huge kind of amazing credit to kind of New York and, and the people behind NACTO to create guidance for cities, not just for highways. And uh, so we, that came online kind of right at this perfect moment where we needed the guidance because our awakening was there. Um, this video, I can't recommend enough. It has really great dramatic music, how the Dutch got their cycle paths. Just watch it. Uh, it's been viewed a million times now. So probably everybody on the webinar has seen it. But if you haven't, please check it out. It gives the whole history. And that's when I started realizing that we were we were in this work for decades, not just, you know, I've been at it a, a decade. And I think, you know, as opposed to the Dutch that that worked you know, initially with those experiments, not knowing what the end is in mind, you know, we are working now knowing what is possible. And that's that's a great kind of privilege. And, and we'll talk about how much faster uh, it makes it possible to go. Um, so th this is one of the funny little anecdotes kind of early on. So it was like 2010, 2011. Uh, 2010, we had a bond in November. So it had been 2011 that we were funded to reconstruct Third Street downtown. It was going to have a center turn lane, painted bike lanes, the transit street was 4th Street. This is formerly known as the Lance Armstrong Bikeway, uh, uh, though I don't use the term anymore. But um, we had a council member that pushed us really hard to get to protection. And uh, we were starting to think about, well, if we're going to pour everything in concrete, why don't we do it integral? And why should we do slime green? Um, so anyway, we, we kind of went against the green in the US and, and chose Dutch over green. Uh, just a technical note, you can see our conflict markings are all compliant. We use the bright green retroflective stuff. When we have traffic messages, this is more of an architectural cohesion choice. So 2012 was a super big year when things started really coming together. Um, we got it. We were one of the first six cities admitted into the Green Lane project. And when we got into our orientation, they made it very clear that New York is not one of our peers and they were kind of the the grandmother, grandfather of the effort in the US and, and we were there to learn from them. We actually went on study tours to New York City. Uh, but we were in that first cohort of six, which was a huge deal. We had like this peer support counseling network to figure out how to do this for the first time in US. If you don't have a mayor like Mayor Bloomberg um, and other leadership that was in place in, in New York City. Um, through the Green Lane project, we got our first study tour to the Netherlands. This was a super huge deal. Um, the picture there is our public works director and bicycle program manager. And uh, I like to joke that my claim to fame is in 2012, uh, she offered me a spot on that tour. And I was like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't take me because I'll go to vacation uh, to a place like the Netherlands. You should take the city manager. And to her credit, she got the city manager there. So. These study tours really kind of awaken the possibilities. Uh, you can watch it online, but uh, I think the city manager said, I hadn't had fun riding a bike uh, since I was a kid. You know, we, we heard kind of persistent concerns about our work, you know, back in 2012. And then after that trip, we didn't hear anything ever again uh, in that regard. So uh, through the Green Lane project, we also got connected with Think Bike, uh, which was uh, again, kind of this uh, late 2012 awakening. So uh, for me personally, it was it was my first kind of exposure to Dutch uh, planners, engineers, policymakers, and it, it was kind of absolutely uh, amazing and enlightening uh, because uh, they come at you with statements of the obvious with their um, kind of uh, second language English and the kind of broken broken English and really kind of blunt statements of, of fact. Um, so this is uh, Richard Andre and Tom are the three folks at the table next to Anik there. Um, yeah, so two day event uh, like um, others had described. And so this is, I'm gonna present everything in quotes. Um, so the first one was capture short trips by bicycle. And th this kind of hit me like a brick where uh, this is super obvious. And I, I had seen this chart in grade school for whatever reason, I have no idea. 
Uh, but the huge takeaway is if you have safe, you know, if you follow those five uh, principles that Chris went through um, and you have safe, direct, uh, comfortable, attractive networks, uh, you know, we know walking will be uh, the best trip for very, very short trips and transit and driving cars has utility and longer trips. Uh, but bicycling will emerge as the preferred and fastest and best method uh, for these medium range trips. So they say, go capture the short trips by bicycle. Uh, so they recommended explicitly, why don't you catch 15% of trips under three miles? And you can see from this chart, they're catching like 40%. Uh, so they gave us an attainable uh, you know, goal in, in the US. We added this, uh, just uh, I'll talk about quantified planning in a minute, but we said from three to nine miles, you know, given this curve goes out and, you know, Austin is sprawling, why don't we catch the top part of the curve? So we said we catch 7% of trips from three to nine miles. Um, the next piece of obvious advice is invest in your network where the short trips are. So they, they actually, in, uh, they had this tool called Move Meter, which was experimental at the time or, or very new. Uh, it was not really translated into English, uh, and I didn't really know what units it was in, but it produced these spider diagrams showing you where short trips were from the, the region's origin and destination travel models. And they were able to say, you know, with network modeling on this web tool that 50% of trips through one of our major congested intersections downtown had 50% of short trips uh, less than three miles, which is this huge aha of you know, we complain about congestion and that was kind of the number one issue as we were, uh, you know, starting to rethink how uh, how our modal networks work. And if you complain about congestion, you should really see that you're using a hammer for everything rather than necessarily the, the best mode for what trip. Um, I think uh, Chris said this, you, you can't have a bike plan without a car plan. So that's really the spirit of this. These are the actual we did a central city network planning exercise uh, in our Think Bike workshop. And this is the bike network that we envisioned. Uh, this is about, I think, 10 miles, um, maybe seven miles, kind of north to south, kind of 290 up to Koenig, if you know Austin. Uh, this was the car plan, this was the transit plan. So even back then, they were encouraging us to think like this and we were kind of uh, in lockstep that we we needed to be understanding all these networks at the same time so throw them all together this is what it looks like it's overwhelming um, until you kind of digest it but this this is the reality of what it takes to plan kind of consciously um, for all modes um, the next is uh you know feed transit with bikes um, you know, we, we started, uh, we integrated this into our bike planning um, in a 2014 update I'll talk about in a second, but uh, kind of the obvious way to put this is, I think in the same kind of time, uh, time profile, you know, uh, time is the budget that people travel on. The land area that you can access by bikes is 16 times larger than the walking area. And, and uh, like was said, these modes are not in competition. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, when I last heard it, it was 40%. And as we were preparing for the webinar, now 50% of all trips in the Netherlands start by bike. 50% uh, of all trips to transit start by bike, which is just a, an incredible number showing that uh, the bike transit combo creates an amazing level of kind of access and flexibility that fixed route transit doesn't have on its own. So. Uh, don't just talk about the first and last mile. It's the first and last mile if you're walking and miles if you're biking or riding a scooter. So the 2014 bike plan, we also kind of, uh, this, this shift in focus um, was born out of that Think Bike workshop where we didn't, we shifted it from the 2009 bike plan of let's have a city that uh, serves people that want a bike. And we shifted around to say, bikes are a tool and we're gonna use them to serve the goals of our city and what is possible with that. Um, because we had so many good examples uh, and we started doing that network planning, um, we went after creating a vision for a network um, in 2014. And if it, if it wasn't gonna serve kind of comprehensive travel demand to catch those short trips, we weren't doing our job. So this wasn't about getting a facility on the ground, it was getting a network on the ground. Um, and, we, you, this is our version of the spider diagram. I, due to a, an issue with the translation of that move meter tool, I never could 
get an answer on what the units were. <laughs> so I just recreated it in GIS. This is like point to point as crow flies uh, and it's too busy to see. And then you have to make a heat map to see where the short trips are. Uh, so we got a lot of benefits out of uh, kind of doing our own science around that same methodology that, that the Dutch woke us up to. Uh, you can see like in the downtown area, like right by the river, there's an, each one of these is a factor of two kind of decaying of short trips. So you can just see the incredible magnitude of short trips uh, and, and even the pattern that exists kind of along the major developed spines in Austin. So we uh, did our network planning and then we double checked it against where the short trips are. And, and this is the network that we envisioned uh, that I'm turning on right now. And you can see the network lines up very, very well uh, with where uh, our analysis of the, the trips were located. So we were routing people in and around the central city, uh, longer trips into the central city, and also getting to transit stations and local destinations. Another uh, kind of huge piece that came out of just internet watching and, and, and following kind of examples around the world is what uh, Sevilla was able to do. And, you know, as, as an early follower of Portland, who, you know, their amazing success and kind of conscious planning over 20 years uh, got them to the 7% mode share. Um, what Sevilla was able to do in three to four years through an investment of an all ages and abilities bike network in a very short period of time was to do what Portland did in 20 and three to four. So that was just this huge aha um, to us of, of what is possible and what rate of change is possible. Um, in studying up for this webinar, I just watched, there's a great video, uh, a street films video about uh, Sevilla's, uh, and, and they were also Dutch inspired um, in, in trying to understand what they were after in creating the network. Uh, but the reason they moved that fast is because their leadership uh, wanted to do build that network in a single election cycle, uh, which is kind of a mind bender of, of what is possible. Um, when we were envisioning this full network, I had it in mind that we uh, the best way to make the case was to make a cost benefit case. And we just had uh, uh, the best project that we could find was uh, we built up a $150 million network. So we were not, we were including all these kind of low cost, high impact projects uh, that created a network and we were avoiding complete reconstruction projects uh, like that Third Street picture that I showed. Third Street was built because it was named and it had, you know, I think five, uh, 10 million plus dollars to rebuild eight blocks. So we weren't doing that with, with our cost benefit case. Um, there was a freeway project to add a single toll lane in each direction, and it was ended up costing like a 200 million. Uh, and we we calculated how many trips that gets near downtown, and we calculated the all ages and abilities bicycle network's ability to get trips directly into downtown with a short trip capture with our regional data. And we actually showed that we could get uh, 20,000 trips directly into downtown, whereas the Mopac project got it outside of downtown. They still have to get through the congested, uh, you know, signal system to get into the downtown and the All Ages Network could do it for less. Uh, that wasn't to say, uh, I won't say my opinion about the Mopac Improvement Project, but that's to put the All Ages and Abilities Bike Network investment on the map in a big way. Um, we also, uh, we're traffic obsessed in Austin. So all the big talking points were 170,000 fewer daily trips, you know, citywide, how many less trips, you know, now I'm uh, actually thinking that the, the carbon reductions are the most important thing that we're still kind of under talking about, uh, you know, saving millions in direct driving costs a year, physical activity. Um, and, and this carbon reduction, uh, just, just for context, I think it's something like 11 or 14 days of all the cities driving carbon consumption um, is, is the savings in a year. So really significant amounts of carbon saved. So uh, this that's the, all the 2014 bike plan. And um, basically that narrative, and, and this is a case for good planning, got picked up by our advocates and, and really promoted. It was the most, uh, in, a, in a city plan, uh, you know, funding kind of uh, study of, or a transportation study of what should we do for transportation in Austin, fully funding the bike network came out on top. Uh, 2016 had unprecedented levels of funding proposed. Uh, this is the prior level of all funding since 1984 and what was directly to bikes and trails uh, in 2016. And uh, it surpassed all, all other funding. Uh, and this, this proposition handily passed. 
so uh, we went uh, to the Netherlands again in 2018. Um, you know, huge, we, we had, had a delegation of 10. We had lots of kind of elected leadership on that trip. Major shifts in kind of leadership, again, seeing what is possible. Uh, we chose the Netherlands over Sevilla uh, because we really wanted to work with the end in mind. Um, and then a lot of the kind of observations, just personally, uh, this is the Dutch, I mean, the Amsterdam flag there. Um, uh, you know, they're very flexible in their design. Um, and, uh, you know, they don't approach any two intersections exactly the same and don't sweat the details. Those five principles uh, that Chris went through, if you follow those, you will have success. And uh, so quickly, um, where we're headed, we put the five principles uh, in, in our bike plan, and I thought they were kind of high and lofty. Uh, we have one project that's our most ambitious project on Shoal Creek. Uh, we, I think, finally have started delivering on all five of these principles. Uh, someone pointed out in the practice sessions for the webinar that uh, what's up with this traffic signal? So all of these people are riding this facility before it's technically open and we were in the process of switching over the signal. We're putting rain gardens in for attractiveness. So really, really uh, strong responses from the public. So quickly, um, and I know I'm short on time, um, so this is what we're up to now. We are trying to hit a bike plan target of 50% all ages network build out by the end of 2020 uh, in a town that doesn't have a strong mayor. Uh, we are getting very close. This green line is what our forecasted uh, kind of percentage of network build out and, and some of the purple is gonna become green. Uh, so we're working really hard towards that target right now. I'm gonna quickly kind of flip through this. This is a time progression of our all ages network, not painted bike lane network. So in 2010, we had fragments you know, slowly coming online. Uh, 2016 is when we got that funding. And then now this is everything that we're tackling in 2020. And we're able with our kind of tracking our facilities to look into the future into 2026 is kind of what we're forecasting now. And you can see that this network build out, uh, Austin's a very large city. These are to scale Amsterdam and New Amsterdam. Uh, you can see the grain of the network. It's fairly fine grain. It's really kind of coming into being. This is a, a fairly significant accomplishment, I think. And now we are starting to look towards our 2025 build out target of 80%. You can see the green of what we're forecasting with known projects is getting very close. Uh, I think personally, I think we're gonna have to change our target uh, and make it more aggressive and build out faster. That's it, thank you. Thanks very much, Nathan. I really appreciate that. Um, we are going to move right along with our final uh, final panelist um, for the day before we get into some Q and A, uh, and that is uh, Will Hansfield, uh, who is joining us uh, from the District of Columbia. Uh, Will is a bicycle planner for the District of Columbia's uh, uh, Department of Transportation, or DDOT, working primarily to retrofit the street grid to include safe and accessible bicycle facilities across the city. Uh, Will has worked in the transportation planning and policy field for the last 15 years in Los Angeles, Denver, uh, and the Washington, D.C. area. Um, so, Will, I'll be uh, handing the screen to you now, and I'll let you know when you're up and running. Great. Show my screen and get into the full screen mode here. And Looks thanks good. for having me. Great. Uh, wonderful. Thanks for having me, and thank you for everyone who's joining on this webinar. Um, uh, just like Nate, I've uh, had a history of growth in the bike planning industry, and, um, and I think we all have great conversion stories. And, and mine does involve also the Dutch Bike Workshop. Um, so we're going to go into uh, a couple of the, the, the planning backgrounds that preceded this, um, some of the themes, the network plan that resulted from the Dutch Bike Workshop in particular, and then one of the projects we're going to take a, a bit of a deep dive with, we're touching on another one, but we, we basically have four really significant projects that came out of the Dutch Bike Workshop. Um, over to the right, there are just some of the, the direct outcomes from the day that we did this 2016 workshop. So how to do different intersections, how to do crossings, and um, just for context, the White House is on this diagram. It's, it's about 100 feet to the east of here, so it's a, it's a significant area for us in Washington, D.C. And the idea that came from that for Pennsylvania Avenue was these EBLs, protected bike lanes on both sides. And on G Street, a two-way um, two cycle track on G Street. And four years later, we're now working on that specifically and uh, able to, to go through it. So one of the, the things we start with is just the goals that Washington, D.C. has for 
recycling. I think everyone can, can read through this, but but it's the same types of things that, that other cities have adopted. And um, uh, what we've really come to understand is that the network is is maybe the most important aspect of it, right? The, to, the, to make sure that it actually works is having the connection so you don't leave people stranded. Um, but a couple of the other lessons we've learned was something about resiliency. We had an earthquake in 2011. Uh, my personal story from, from that is I, I walked my then uh, eight months pregnant wife home from downtown on a capital bike share um, where she was just seated and I was pushing because the entire metro and um, street on sur surface street grid was shut down. So, so the bike network and pedestrian network uniquely was really resilient in getting us through that. And then subsequent uh, inc <clears throat> incidents where resiliency is really important. Um, in 2005, we really started with a goal of uh, doing a bike network with the, with our master plan. And around that time, we had hovering between one to two percent of, of overall trips by bike. Um, we in 20, I think it was 2016, we met that five percent um, mode trip, uh, mode share of trips by bike. Um, so we were one year one year late from our 2005 goal. But since then, we we've, we've updated our plan. And now our, our new goal is 75% of all trips by walking, biking, or transit. And we're actually pretty high on that today. So DC is the second highest transit use city in the country after New York um, due to our metro system. Of course, the COVID-19 threat to that is pretty significant and we've seen a huge diminishment of um, all kinds of transit trips and a huge increase in, in bicycle trips. Um, but we also have a vision zero goals um, that are related to our dangerous roads. And we still, every year is different, but we still have you know, between 20 and 30 people in the district that are that are killed annually in various types of traffic collisions. And um, sadly, many of them are, are cyclists. I think we've, we've been good at lowering the rates, but um, even one is too many. So we're, we're trying really hard to make facilities that are safe for all ages. In 2014, we released this plan um, at the time, just, just for context, I was working on it as a consultant uh, for the district. So I, I did work for DC, I was a uh, private sector. Um, but, but one of the things that it had is this, this very connected network of um, primarily cycle tracks and bike lanes. And you can see how ambitious it is. I don't have the baseline that we're comparing it to, but, but suffice to say, most of this stuff did not exist in 2014. Um, but the, the area we're gonna focus on is in that circle, that's the foggy bottom. Um, the State Department is there. It's west of the White House, um, GW University, and a lot of international institutions are there. So the World Bank, the IMF, um, Organization of American States, and those all generally have very high rates of, of bicycling as, uh, as employers. And so uh, we were fortunate to ha have the participation of the Dutch Cycling Embassy to host this, this West End uh, deep dive and focus on um, the kind of facilities that, that, that they would recommend to us. What you see here on the left is um, these are the bike lanes on Pennsylvania Avenue. That was really kind of a high watermark <clears throat> in 2010 for, for bicycling. It was a very challenging project to execute. It's the parade route between uh, the Capitol and the uh, White House that's used for inaugurations and many other national events. So um, to be able to pull that off was really, uh, at the time, a, a real significant victory for, for bicycling in the nation's capital. Um, but we're looking at the, the west area. And the, the, um, the outcome of the workshop, to put it mildly, was this, this network that you see in green. The blue stuff was already there. And just, just keep a mental image of that. So, so none of the green stuff existed in 2016. Um, and in fairness, it doesn't exist today, but that, that's where we're going to pick it up. Uh, but we, this is around the time we're thinking very hard about protected bike lanes and how to use them, where to use them, and, and when to use them. Um, so some of the, the things that we have learned, you can, you can read along, but um, the, the main one is just the degree of participation that you get when you do protected bike lanes. And over here on the right, that, that young man is my son. He's eight years old. Um, this is a project we recently installed on the Brentwood Parkway and really going towards an ATE kind of, um, kind of approach to bike lanes. And so Starting in 2005, when we released our bike master plan, we were at this high stress, um, you know, very confident rider spot that Darren talked about in his presentation. And now having, having a, a few years more of uh, developing facilities, we're, we're into this you know, pretty confident, but, but we're, we're expanding it. But we, we really wanna get into this area that the Dutch are, are in where 
uh, riders of all ages and all abilities can ride pretty much anywhere in town. Um, so that's our general trajectory is going in, you know, towards that. Um, here's an example of our, is another 2010 project, the, the uh, 15th Street Cycle Track, just for context about what we're talking about when we, when we use these in DC. Um, so this is the project we're gonna really deep dive on, and that's G Street. Um, so remember that map I showed you, the outcome of the uh, Dutch Cycling Workshop. These are all the facilities that are currently under planning that, that have some construction date associated with them and all of them should be finished by 2022. So, so we really took to heart this, this planning exercise and have now um, put into our, our plans and our budget doing these projects. So I'm about to do the notice to proceed with our contractor on the green one, that's G Street. Um, I think we've sort of beat that, that horse, but, um, but we're gonna start building it uh, as soon as two weeks from now. Um, this is another recent one we did over here, this P Street Southeast, uh, sorry, Southwest. And we've, we're taking a lot of um, uh, lessons from this and other projects. One is to use very commonly available materials. We have a lot of utilities operating in the city that for many reasons are allowed to um, do utility cuts and change the street around various ways for, for construction. And so we want to make sure that the materials we're using, they can replace. And this is a standard parking block. They're eight inches, eight inches wide, six feet long, and you can pretty much get them anywhere in the United States. So um, it, it creates a pretty nice long um, cycle track buffer. Uh, in certain cases, we'll use a wider version of this, of the more custom-made concrete one, but it's, it's something that can help us really rapidly modify our streets to include safe bicycling in infrastructure. Those and flex posts and a couple other small items really gets us to where we wanna be. So that's what we chose to use as our, our buffer for G Street. So this is our, our goal is, is to get to a cross section that looks like this. And today, this is this is what you see, is uh, a 25 mile per hour street, which isn't too bad. Luckily, we have a pretty low speed limit uh, for neighborhoods in, in DC. The citywide is 25 miles per hour. Um, so we have a little bit of an advantage there, but you can just see how wide the travel lanes are in this case and, and how, how much extra space that there, there is. Um, we had a couple issues with, with um, the curbside uses like bus boarding in one place and, and just the sort of frequency of pick up and drop off, which has been increasing. But this is this is our plan. This is going out to, like I said, the, the contractor in about a week. Um, one of the neat things about this is it does intersect with these other networks. So um, in that, that big picture diagram of all the intersecting street grids, 20th Street was one of the ones that um, that we we're building also this, this calendar year. Um, so this is G Street, it's gonna come across and we have uh, an interesting inter intersection treatment where the, if you wanna turn onto 20th Street, you have this little waiting spot right here. So you can, you can hang out without any conflict. What you don't see back here is that we've, we've blocked this off of traffic. So um, there's a little bit of, you know, done by others. It's just, it's also us, but it's a different project. So a uh, different, probably a different construction contractor. Um, but this is one of the nice things about doing them all at once and what, what the Dutch Cycling Workshop delivered was, was sort of the, the thinking and institutional support. Um, and I'll add one other thing. So I, I didn't work for DDOT at the time of that workshop. I worked for a, a business improvement district. Uh, Darren actually had my same, the same job I have now. He was, he was uh, in that role at DDOT. But um, it, the lesson is to include lots and lots of people and stakeholders in these types of planning exercises because I fully understood and, and, and was committed to this, this effort, even though I didn't work for the city at the time. Now I do, so I, I have the benefit of having that legacy. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of things and, and maybe Nathan's examples also are, are to that, that, that same um, uh, theme of, of inclusive planning where you have a lot of other you know, potential professionals and the professionals in the field that are all on board for the same thing. And, and also the elected leaders of the area that, that can understand what the goal is. I want to bring up this slide. This is this is we had some some issues with um, like how do we do left turns across a two-way cycle track where the driver might not see somebody coming from their essentially from their blind spot going this way. And so what we've done is we've separated the phase. The signals only gives a left turn when the cyclists are stopped, and it's a lagging left turn. So it's after the cyclists go. But to do that, we actually had to create more space. We had to take parking off the north side of the street to, to create enough stacking distance to separate the phases. So that was one of the comp complex things. It only happens at three intersections along this whole 
a nearly mile long corridor. So it's it's not the, the most common thing, but it, it also forces us to do a little taper over here if you wanna get into the, the, the design details and, and minutia. Uh, another one that's sort of interesting is this intersection treatment. This is in Virginia, uh, which is this this street right here going diagonal and, uh, and G Street. Um, there is a connection to the Teddy Roosevelt Bridge, which leads you to Virginia about 100 feet to the left of this. Um, and so we wanted to make sure people could get up to that point. And um, we also have a plan for in development for Virginia Avenue bikeways. We're, we're debating whether it's going to be center running or side running right now. So in the meantime, we're going to strike the intersection like this. Um, there's a flashing signal that, that's, that's push button activated. We're adding a beacon right here, a push button beacon right there. So you can activate the signal while still on your bike. Um, so it's it's not perfect, but again, the, the sort of Dutch example of design flexibility and uh, and trying to take care of all the potential movements is what we're after. Um, and this is that project, the Virginia Avenue cycle track. So it really connects a big uh, section. So this is Georgetown, the oldest part of Washington D.C., and then this is the National Mall. So there's a real um, need to to do these kind of things and um, uh, make sure that the the whole network is connected. So. Uh, that is a, I'll just touch on that very briefly, but it's an interesting project in a couple of respects. One is it, um, it has so many different curbside uh, conflicts and different institutions along the way, like the State Department itself. Um, it's a giant roadway. It's, uh, it's 64 feet wide uh, lane, lane width. And then there's another, I think it's 70 total when you include the median. So we have a lot of space to work with. Um, there's food trucks and buses and all kinds of things. And so we have, you know, one one model is the center running that you see here, and, and one model, uh, I think maybe I lost this. There it is, uh, is a curbside running. So we, we've been trying to do pros and cons of each and figure out what the best the best approach is for this one. Um, there, there I had the slides out of order, so that's your curbside running version. Uh, and it also runs along the Watergate, um, the, you know, the site of the famous Nixon robbery um, and cover up uh, is right here essentially. And so there's at this point, eight lanes of traffic, it looks like this. So we're trying to find a, a way that we can not only take some of that asphalt back, but also get to a, a much nicer feel. So we have an option that's like just much more of like a multi-use trail over here, uh, where we take about half that space or something in one version, all that space and, and make it a much nicer experience. Um, and I'll leave you with this slide. So this is again that, that recent project, and this is a bus boarding platform that we've done to make sure that our bus boardings are still 88 while the cycle track can go over the, uh, uh, the facility. So, so we're, we're sharing. Uh, my contact information is here. Um, the project managers for G Street, 20th, 21st, and Virginia Avenue are all here if anyone wants to get further design details. And we have the websites up here that'll be in the, in the um, uh, presentation materials that uh, uh, Dan who will share. But thank you again, and I just wanted to say um, to the Dutch, thank you for, for believing in us and, and having faith that when you invest in these workshops and this, this level of work, which is significant, that it, it will take it on. And, and we're honored to have been uh, chosen, and, and we're honored to have uh, some results to show for it. So uh, come back in a year, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have half the stuff built that we, we talked about, and then in two years we'll have all of it built. But, uh, but thank you again to everybody, and thanks for having me. Right. Thank you so much um, for wrapping up those presentations. That was ex an excellent story from Washington, D.C., as well as the other, other cities. Uh, we have a bit of a limited period of time here for questions, but we're going to do uh, a few of them and have actually made arrangements to record a separate Q&A response session for you all, and we'll post that again. So we'll get through more of those questions separately uh, with our panelists if we have time. But I, many of the questions, many of the issues you all are asking about come down to this, this question of, what are the big obstacles standing in our way? How do we, we're seeing the Dutch inspiration and we're trying to get there, but there are things uh, standing in the way of US cities trying to do this obstacles um, that, that they're experiencing. And um, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Jeanette Sadek Khan, if, if you're still with us and, and would be willing to take this question uh, first, um, and I'll ask my panelists to take themselves off mute if they can um, to, to respond to some of these questions. Um, your experience, really leading New York City in this direction um, has inspired so many other cities and, and you're, I'm sure, observing those other cities kind of moving in that process. Is there something you see as a unique um, obstacle um, that, that is, it still needs to be overcome in many places in the U.S. to really get to the point where we have safe, comfortable, connected bike networks? 
I think uh, a big piece is having a vision for where you want the city to go. That it's not just about putting in one bike lane here, one bike lane there. You know, people really don't understand, you know, what that actually does for a city. The idea that you're, what you're trying to deliver, you know, that you want to make the city safer for everyone. You want to provide choices for people so they can get around more affordably and easily. Those people need to know the reason why these infrastructure investments are being made. And I think, you know, there's always going to be controversy when you try new things. It's, I remember one time getting a question from a Canadian audience of like, how did you get unanimous consent for your bike lanes? It's like only <laughs> Canadians could ask that question, but there will always be people who are skeptical. And so I think the idea of moving very, very quickly to show what's possible uh, is also key. So having a vision, moving quickly, and then sort of measuring the impact because it's very easy for people, skeptics, to just say, oh, you know, that store closed because of the bike lane, or my business is down, or traffic is much worse. So having actually the data to combat that, to say, actually, no, traffic is better, and better for business, and it's much safer, are very important ways to message out what's happening on the street that goes beyond the status quo. That, that whole idea of our streets are for cars is a mental piece that we have to break through. So I think, you know, sort of providing that vision and breaking the kind of mindset that says streets are for cars and showing what's possible. I think that that's really important. And that's why this moment has been so incredible to see what cities are doing around the world to reclaim this road space. They're moving quickly to take advantage of the opportunity that, that comes from our streets that are basically empty, you know, or they have been up until now. And so it really is this blank slate to show what's possible when a street is not completely covered in cars. So those would be some observations about where we go from here. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate all those points. Um, and I think that they, they sound familiar probably to many in the audience, um, uh, seeing their own community's approaches. Uh, Chris, to kick it to you, I, I wonder from the other perspective, from the Dutch perspective, uh, looking to the US and seeing what we're doing here, um, what would you say is is the maybe the untapped opportunity or, or, the, or the place we could still be doing improvements? Maybe from if the Dutch were to come here and just really pick apart what we're, what we're working on, uh, is there one area where we could really be doing doing better? Well, I think it, it comes down to this holistic approach and, and, and Nathan in particular in Austin, I think that should be held up as a model for, for US cities moving forward. And, and one thing he didn't mention in his presentation because there's so much to it, is that they actually had to take this plan to the voters in 2016 and get approval for a, a funding package. Um, and it was pitched to the voters of Austin as uh, not a few cycle lanes, but a comprehensive network that was going to help with the city's goals around affordability, equity, resiliency, sustainability, uh, congestion, uh, congestion reduction. Um, and when you put cycling in that larger context of being able to ch achieve the larger goals for your city, um, I think you can accomplish a great deal and, and get more people on board. And that's exactly what Austin did in um, they got the votes that they needed to to uh, secure this funding. And so um, I think cities need to get past this idea of, of building individual routes uh, based on incidents and opportunities that arise uh, and start thinking much bigger and much more comprehensively. Wonderful. Yeah, no, I, I, I can see all those as well. Um, uh, and Bill, uh, you know, you're working at the national level with, with these advocacy networks throughout the country and, and really looking at a lot of places, really rating cities on what they're doing. I wonder if, if uh, those other responses, would you have anything else to add on uh, where you really see that low hanging fruit opportunity uh, where cities could really make a lot of improvement um, by doing something in particular, taking one particular approach? I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, what Jeanette um, and Chris both said are, are, are dead on. Um, I, I think having a vision um, that's bigger than bicycling and bigger than walking and, and, is, and is based on outcomes that you want. And, you know, I think right now we're in a, we're in a period where um, I think, you know, uh, Chris said early on, you know, trying things out. You know, I, I think looking for opportunities uh, so that people can experience this, but then making the case that it's, you know, it's good for all of those outcomes that we're all really after um, and showing that, you um, the examples like Austin, um, I think is I think is a really great example to share because it's, you know, I think I think, you know, for, for a long time in bike advocacy, we you know, the, the eye roll happens, you know, when you talk about, you know, some cities that, you know, are or the Dutch even, you know, like, you know, as if the Dutch were somehow uh, genetically predetermined to having great bicycling facilities. Um, 
I think when you have an example like Austin, um, people can kind of go, oh, wow, we can do that too. Um, so I, yeah, I think having a big vision that includes bicycling, but towards bigger outcomes is, is key. Wonderful. No, thank you for that. And I, I actually wanted to take the discussion in a slightly different direction with our final questions for, for Will and Nathan. Um, a tough question that we're all grappling with now, but I, one of our uh, attendees put it very well um, and asked uh, and identified, I guess, that comfort is really a key principle in these cycling networks that we're learning from the Dutch and we've identified in the U.S. as one of our priorities is comfort. But uh, we are also recognizing that uh, low income communities, communities of color um, may have to overcome significant barriers uh, to comfort, uh, which are related to all sorts of related issues, uh, socioeconomic, um, safety, health, um, that comfort uh, issue can we really need to be thinking through that carefully for low-income communities um, and the question is how can we as planners and engineers work with other agencies and really get to the point where we can fully address uh, barriers uh, faced by communities of color and low-income communities um, especially with respect to comfort I wonder if maybe Nathan uh, I'll ask you to respond to that first and then we'll uh, maybe follow up yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I think as just a consumer of like the political moment that's happening right now, you know, just evaluating uh, institutional racism, uh, systemic discrimination, like that is a societal question, a super tricky one. I think we're going to have to bring, I mean, I think another thing that, that is remarkable from the Dutch is they bring a comprehensive like societal approach to their problems and their goals as a society. And in the U.S., it's often a lot more fragmented. Um, so I think, uh, not not trying to be a, have a cop out answer here, but I think that's going to take a lot of thinking, work, advocacy. Um, you know, I'll just say one of Austin's kind of worst marks is, you know, if you read about uh, spatial segregation in cities, often around, uh, you know, basically today around socioeconomic kind of access to where you can afford to live. Uh, you know, which is discordant with the tool of bicycling from a short trip perspective, you know, unless you're using bicycling to get to transit assets. So, you know, you're at a, this huge detriment to even get there. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're taking a longer transit trip to where you're going and you have to now bicycle to get to the transit trip. Like that's, that's what our society is offering uh, mm -hmm. to people that can't afford to live in the center part of the city. Uh, so these, these kind of barriers of how do we uh, align our state tax code to be less displacing. You know, like these are very big issues and um, I've kind of doubled down my commitment to study, speak up for them, um, and and hopefully we can make make serious progress with, with the right kind of understanding and attention to those issues. Thanks so much, Nathan. And, and uh, Will, anything to add about that from your perspective? Yeah, to, to be honest, <clears throat> I wish I, I had a great answer because it's still something that we struggle with in a, in a major and, and pretty profound way here in DC. And, and um, I'll give you two kind of interesting examples. One is there is this longstanding narrative um, in that the black people don't bike. And it's easily disproven by just observing who's biking on the streets. But a friend of mine actually started an organization called Black Women Bike. I think a lot of you may know Veronica Davis. And it's, it was to counter that narrative that, oh, that's that's like something for others, right? But it, it's, so I think a lot more, I don't know if it's time, but but a lot more people have been sort of adjusted their thinking about that. Um, but we still have real challenges. I, our, and it's not just in the the, the, um, the most disadvantaged ward. So our most disadvantaged ward, the council member has come out and said, no no bike projects here essentially, um, which is which is interesting because, you know, I, I Truly believe it's part of an equity approach to, to transportation planning, but at the same time, our wealthiest and whitest ward is also very challenging to do bike planning. And we have an advocacy group that's specifically um, pushing for facilities there. But at the same time, for almost any project that we try to do, we will turn up fierce and litigious opponents in in ward. This is ward three. And so between between Ward Three and Ward Eight, those are our most difficult places to do projects. And it's it's both on the most affluent and resourced end of the spectrum, and the most disadvantaged end of the spectrum. And I wish I had a great answer to say how you do it. I've tried just building the projects, and and those have caused political and PR dustups um, when you just build it. And so I, th I think just more work and more outreach uh, is, is what we're trying now. Um, 
but slowly but surely there's there's places that are sort of in the middle between those poles that used to be harder to plan and build facilities and we're making progress and, and it's becoming easier in those places as we get the facilities in and more people are riding them so i think eventually everything will come around but um but it's, it's a real challenge for us and one that we struggle with um, pretty much every week when we're trying to figure out what's the next project going to be Thank you for that, and I um, I appreciate those those remarks. I think we do have a lot of work ahead of us, but I, I think we're we're seeing some real progress being made in in all areas, and I think we're ready for this challenge that awaits us. Um, if I can if I can speak that way and um, and say that, and I, I wanted to wrap up and, and say I'm, I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions. We did go a bit over our allotted time here. Um, we are planning to record a separate uh, session where we're going to respond to more of these and, and post that and make it available to you. So be on the lookout. For that, um, I, I just wanted to wrap up and, and say that you know though the the Dutch approach I think it is often held up and, and rightly so seen as as our goal and our uh, what we want to get to in the United States. Um, we've moved to the point where we are. It's not just um, that the Dutch are doing this and no one else. But we we are doing this now. We've seen evidence of that in this webinar from the inspiration from New York City um, to what Will and Nathan have to, have to share with us and, and Darren looking at how FHWA is helping to support this activity and. Um, and with Chris uh, and his inspiration and, and kind of Bill looking at it from the national perspective, I think we're moving in the direction we need to be. Um, and I think the key is to keep that momentum up, uh, to use uh, the tools available to us to keep putting um, pressure in and identify ways we can overcome the challenges that our panelists have identified. Um, so I hope that this webinar leaves you with some inspiration for how to continue this in your own communities. Um, I just wanted to say a big thank you again for our entire panel from the opening remarks all the way to the individual panelists. Uh, those contributions are, are so valuable. And I wanted to give a special thanks to those organizations that were behind the planning for this webinar. The Dutch Cycling Embassy, the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Office of Infrastructure and Water Management, the League of American Bicyclists, and the Federal Highway Administration. Um, I appreciate uh, you all joining us today. Thank you so much for your time. And we hope to see you on one of our future webinars. Uh, thanks so much, everyone.